Okay? I think so. All right. Um, I'm still Michelle Burnham, and I'm still the director of the Center for the Arts and Humanities, and uh, my colleague and associate director of the center, Amy Randall, is here, and the manager of the center, Britt Kane, is here, and we are just delighted to be kicking off our faculty fellows programming series uh, with today's event, and we are going to start with a um, raffle of free tickets to the Winchester Mystery House, as well as a giveaway. Uh, of a fantastic book about Sarah Winchester. So um, if you guys want to come on up here and we'll just going to randomly pick. Now we're doing half of these at the beginning of the event and the other half at the end of the event. So if you didn't get it now, you still have a good chance of getting it later. We're giving these tickets out in pairs. Anna Sedano, come on up. <laughs> Josh Valenzuela. <laughs> Pat Curia. Alejandra Valadares. <laughs> Olivia Pollard. <laughs> Andrew Landeros. All right, our media guy. <clears throat> Jackie Hendricks. And for the book, Amy Randall. <laughs> Since I'm a historian, so. <laughs> um, I just want to say something very quickly about the fellowship program um, in the Center for the Arts and Humanities. We give fellowships each year to faculty and students, and these fellowships are really at the heart of what the center does because they support scholarship and creative work in the arts and humanities. And these fellowships each year are aligned with an annual theme. This year, that theme is memory and movements. Uh, and I'm sure you'll see today as the discussion unfolds how those themes are reflected in Amy's project and in the program that she's organized and put together. Um, so the Faculty Fellows series creates interdisciplinary programs that basically emerge from the ideas and commitments of the faculty uh, who are conducting research and doing creative work. So it's my pleasure now to introduce the moderator and organizer of today's panel, Amy J. Luke is Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Composition here at Santa Clara University. Her research and teaching focus on histories of rhetorical instruction and practice, women's rhetorics, feminist historiography, and public memory. Her book, published in 2020, titled A Shared History, Writing in the High School, College, and University, interrogates the ostensible divide between high school and college and the role that divide has played in shaping writing instruction in the United States. Her recent research builds on this work by attending to the conceptual boundaries and metaphors that shape history and remembrance at various sites from universities and the tribal homelands on which they are built to historic attractions like the Winchester Mystery House. She's currently writing a book which is tentatively titled Haunting Women's Public Memory, Native Ghosts, and the Remembering of the Winchester Mystery House. So please welcome and help me turn things over to Amy Luke.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, and thank you to the Center for Arts and Humanities for um, sponsoring this research and this event that we uh, have tonight. I'm really excited about this panel. I'm really excited not to be the point of this panel, but instead to be bringing together three different um, perspectives on this site that has been of interest to me for some time. Is that mic up there still on? Because I'm still hearing something. Is it just me? Can we turn that one off? Thank you. Um, that's been of interest to me for, uh, for many years now. Uh, this book that I'm writing has been in process for many years now. Um, but these perspectives are still really evolving, so I, I'm going to have a lot to learn tonight from our three uh, panelists as well, who are all bringing different perspectives uh, to this one shared site of the Winchester Mystery House and the lands that it's on. I want to begin first, though, by uh, pausing to acknowledge that Santa Clara University sits on the land of the Ohlone and the Muekma Ohlone people, who trace their ancestry through the missions Dolores, Santa Clara, and San Jose. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Let us take a moment of silence to pay respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people past and present. Thank you. So I want to introduce uh, each of our panelists briefly before um, we get a conversation started between them. We'll start at the end there uh, with Mary Jo Ignofo. Mary Jo Ignofo is a historian who has written books and articles, curated historical museum exhibits, been interviewed for documentary films and podcasts airing in the US, Europe, and Japan. She holds degrees from Santa Clara University and San Jose State University, and uh, she taught U.S. and California history for many years at De Anza College, just up the road in Cupertino. Her biography of Sarah Winchester, which some of you have or will have the opportunity to win tonight, uh, is called Captive of the Labyrinth, Sarah L. Winchester, Heiress to the Rifle Fortune. It was first published in 2012, made into an audiobook by Penguin Random House in 2017, and just recently came out in a new edition with 27 additional images in 2022. It's considered by many, among them myself, to be the most respective and authoritative account of Winchester's life history. So we're really uh, fortunate to have Mary Jo Ignafo here with us. Jan and Bame is the house historian for the Winchester Mystery House. Ms. Bame's fascination with Sarah Winchester's intriguing home began at an early age when she was growing up in nearby Santa Clara and has never left her. Working her way through college in the late 70s, giving tours of the popular attraction, she's returned several times to fill various operational and management positions over the past 40 years, serving as tour manager from 2013 through 2016, before moving into her current role as house historian in 2017, a role which she is uh, the first to occupy. So it's kind of an interesting uh, emergent sense of, of history and, and history making at the site. Uh, her, uh, some of her accomplishments in this role have included scripting and developing and overseeing the launch of tour scripts, working with uh, the Zilani Glass Conservation of Oakland, to survey the priceless collection of Victorian era stained glass windows in the house, researching and acquiring furnishing and art, providing media interviews, writing historical pieces, serving as a historical resource, resource during the recent filming of a major motion, motion picture about the house, for those of you who have seen the movie Winchester, conducting in-depth VIP tours, and working with other artisans and contractors to carry out restore, restoration projects within the mash, mansion in a historically accurate and respectful manner. Ms. Bame earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Santa Clara University, <laughs> majoring in foreign languages and minoring in art history. She's lived, studied, and worked in Europe and holds a master's degree in international business from the Monterey Institute of International Studies. 
And last but not least, next to me here, Isabella Omne Gomez. Isabella Omne Gomez is a member of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, which is currently seeking restoration as a federally recognized tribe. So I urge you all to please go to their website, muwekma.org, to learn more about that and sign their petition. Isabella is an active representative of her tribe, giving opening blessings and land acknowledgments at events throughout the Bay Area, which is her ancestral homeland. She and her family are devoted to their tribe's cause and enjoy helping in the tribe's information and exhibit booths at, booths at events throughout the area. Isabella also serves as a consultant to mine and Dr. Lee Panich's virtual Santa Clara course ongoing right now, and as an intern working on public history and cultural programming related to Ohlone history on our campus. Isabella is currently a high school senior at Kip King Collegiate High School maybe eventually a Santa Clara <laughs> <laughs> to round out our panel here. Uh, she lives in San Lorenzo with her mother, Gloria, her sister, Georgiana, and uh, her father, Jorge. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, her connection to the Winchester Mystery House is as a descendant of the tribes on whose homelands the house was built, Following the disruptions of missionization, the administrative thefts of lands during the Mexican and American periods, and on whose lands the house, this university, and the rest of the Bay Area development around us remains today. So, this is the very exciting panel that we have today, and I'm going to just kind of arrange this as a conversation, hopefully, so uh, the three of, of these uh, wonderful women can speak to the audience and to one another. I have a few questions our conversation, but I'm going to allow you all to kind of elaborate on one another's points. I might ask a follow-up question here and there, but I want to just kick us off by letting you talk a little bit more. I mentioned a little bit about each of your connection to the site, but I would love to give you each an opportunity to elaborate on your interest in or your <coughs> connection to the site, the Winchester Mystery House. Do you want to start us off, Isabella? Um, probably not. I think it can be left. There you go. Okay. Um, well, when I first heard of the Winchester Mystery House, um, it was probably when I saw ghost shows with my mom. Oh, so when I was little, we would love to watch ghost adventures together. Um, and I remember they mentioned the Mi Winchester Mystery House, and I was like, I was kind of fascinated by it because I saw all the glass stained windows. And I remember they mentioned like the baby lock of hair, and I was like, wow. So that was when I first um, heard about it. Um, but when I think about it, at first, um, I didn't really like put the connection between that being my ancestral homeland because it was more as like a tourist attraction site. It wasn't like, it just didn't make that connection. And my mom and I talked about that before too because she went to the Winchester Mystery House around like the early 2000s. And she actually went with our tribal youth, the Morkmoni youth. Um, and she took a tour there um, and she just talked to me about it. Um, but we never, both me and my mom never really made the connection of that being our ancestral homeland, even though we have a lot of ties to San Jose, both in the past and present. Um, growing up, um, we would do a lot of events um, at San Jose. For example, um, we'd go to the Indian Health Center at San Jose, um, and that's what I grew up doing mainly over there. Um, also, like, tribal gatherings. Um, and recently, we're going to do the Mexica New Year dances there. Um, so there's a lot of present day connections to San Jose, um, and it's a huge part of, um, and relevant part of our ancestral homeland because of the um, connections that we have to it. Um, also, um, historically, in regards to my people and our ancestral homeland, um, there was two Mexican land grants there um, in around, it's in San Jose, but I believe it's like East San Jose, where the Mexican land grants were at. Um, uh, also, I can't. Oh, the Tami Noloni dialect speaking tribal groups are from San Jose in that region. Uh, we can trace it which, um, through missionization. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of history, um, time immemorial, um, in regards to um, my people's ancestral homeland there and the connections and the memories that we've built on it. But um, just thinking about the Winchester Mystery House, like, there was that severed connection because they didn't correlate the two together. More of like a tourist attraction site like Disneyland or something like that than like um, 
uh, a place that my people lived and built memories on. But yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing your work. Um, I first saw the Winchester House when I was three or four years old. I grew up about a mile from here to the west, so just about three miles from Sarah's home. We used to drive by, and I just fell in love with it. And of course, it was in a state of disrepair at that time, but I just thought it was beautiful. And as soon as I was old enough, I got a job giving tours there. And over the past 45 years, I, I've gone away and I've done many other things, but I always seem to come back to Sarah's house. It just, it just draws me. It's like a second home to me. Um, I also had, um, I found out after I started working there that I had a great uncle who worked there at, um, during Sarah's time. I don't know if he was a carpenter or an orchardist. Um, he was a man of many talents, so he could have done a lot of things there. But so I do have that family connection as well. But the more I learned about Sarah um, and her purported story, um, the more interesting it became. And um, so I did work there all through college giving tours. I had a great deal of respect for Sarah Winchester. And um, her story was very sad, I thought. But um, I, too, agree that Mary Jo's book is the authoritative um, version of Sarah's life. So if you really want to learn about Sarah Winchester, read the book. Um, I keep it on my desk as a reference. Um, until I read that book, there was so much I didn't know about Sarah Winchester. And you know, there are many reasons for that, which I'm sure we'll go into during our panel. So um, I came to the story of Sarah Winchester a little bit different. Um, when I was 10 years old, my brother was given a Winchester rifle as a gift. Uh, he was turning 16. And um, I thought it was a rather terrifying gift. Okay. And, um, but it was kind of a coming of age at that time in the 1960s. And then fast forward, he kind of was this bank of Winchester trivia. <laughs> and um, so then fast forward many years, I became a historian and I started writing municipal histories and working in different archives. And a couple of archivists stopped me and said, have you ever seen these um, papers, <clears throat> letters from Sarah Winchester to her lawyer or from um, her lawyer back to her? And uh, wouldn't you want to write a biography on her? And I said, absolutely not. I don't want to. Um, spend five years of my life working on a story about a ghost-obsessed madwoman. Um, and they said, well, read the letters, because they kind of indicate that might not be who she was. So um, for me, I came to the project because of the sources, um, <clears throat> letters, um, property deeds. She owned a lot of real estate. She was uh, quite a real estate investor. Um, uh, agricultural records that her grounds people left, um, her information about her employees. I researched her entire family history back to 1644. Um, she didn't, her people didn't come over on the Mayflower, but darn close. Um, and so uh, to me, I came to the story about because of the sources. I want to uh, just ask you to um, uh, elaborate a little bit for audience members who might not know. Um, one of the things that I'm really I'm interested, interested in that this panel is interested, interested in is, is, is this word public remembrance, um, memory. And, and, and I, I use that, that really intentionally, intentionally myself as opposed to the history, history right? So we have um, a health historian and a historian. Um, but really what they're kind of getting at also are the ways that that history gets told, the ways the stories get told, um, and the ways that those stories can um, be told in multiple ways, right? And, and sometimes kind of have um, other consequences, other outcomes, other than kind of um, historical fact. <laughs> so I just wanna, uh, for any audience members who aren't familiar with the Win Winchester House, Mary Jo or uh, Janin, whoever wants to kind of start, could you just tell us a little bit about what the stories have been and maybe how that contrasts with um, your sense of what the history is that you're interested in bringing into the public remembrance? 
I, uh, sure, I'll, I'll start. So, um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, um, the storyline around the Winchester House um, since about 1923 or so has been um, that the house uh, was built in all its oddities um, by a woman who believed as long as the building kept going on, she would um, not die. So, and the story was that built, um, construction went on 24 seven for 38 years, um, <clears throat> that she felt guilty um, about how many people, including um, na native people, um, killed by the Winchester rifle. Um, so uh, it was a it was a very um, tight mythology, um, partly coming out of advertising from the Winchester Rifle Company, um, who around World War One uh, started to um, uh, identify their. Uh, guns as the guns that won the West. Um, so um, that was the story that was told um, about her. And um, the proprietors of the Winchester House um, embraced and embellished those stories um, as a tourist destination. Yeah, I think that um, I found the story interesting when I was young and accepted it for what it was. Then, of course, as I got older, I began to question it. And um, looking around that house and spending so much time in her home, I felt that she was not crazy at all. Um, we have no proof that she believed in ghosts. I can't imagine anyone being able to sleep if there were hammers going on their property 24 <laughs> hours a day, seven days. That's just ridiculous. Um, but um, I think that. You have to also remember that, you know, I don't, I don't approve of the ways in which the place was marketed for so many years. Um, I have tried in my position to get more history in the history, and um, you know, fighting from the inside is kind of the only way to do it, I think. But um, I think that Sarah was like the rest of us; she was a complicated person. I don't know if she suffered from gun guilt. Um, guns were certainly. A, a different thing back then. They were a useful and necessary tool when you were out on the frontier. Um, and so I don't really know, you know how connected she felt to that. Certainly some of her money came from the guns, well, all of her money. Um, but as you can read in Mary Jo's book, um, the Winchesters made their first fortune making shirts, not making guns. And um, so though Oliver Winchester bought this failing gun company, turned it into the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, that wasn't initially how they made their money. Um, and Sarah's husband, William, was all set to follow in his father's footstep and take over the, take over the um, manufacture of the shirts until the rifles kind of took everything over. But again, we don't know that Sarah suffered from gun guilt or that she believed in ghosts or feared ghosts in any way. Um, I think that it's also important to remember that during her lifetime, Spiritualism was extremely popular, and I believe there were probably a lot of very honest practitioners who believed in what they were doing, and a lot of charlatans who just wanted to make money off of people. Um, but the legends about Sarah started during her lifetime, and there were many of them, and they just, people seem to love to hear scandalous things about other people. And since Sarah, I think, wouldn't really engage when people asked her why she did the things she did, it really wasn't anybody's business. But um, I think people need a reason. So I think a lot of cases they would just make up their own. And I think the idea of the building 24 seven is almost like um, a game of telephone where someone would come to town and they say, oh, you see that beautiful house over there? She's always building. So she would continue to build, certainly. She's always building. She, she's always building. And pretty soon it was like, she's always building 24 seven, you know, all the time. Um, which, again, I just think is a, a rather ridiculous um, idea. But um, the other important thing to remember is that, though I don't necessarily approve of a lot of the stories they told, and I have really tried to, in my position, get um, everyone to tell the stories in a way that indicates that they are not historical fact, but that 
they are in fact legends and stories that grew around Sarah during her life. You can see articles in the paper about her during her life. There was one written in uh, 1911 about how she was on her last deathbed. I'm not sure how many deathbeds you get, but, um, and this was 11 years before she died. You know, there was always something about this poor woman that they were saying. Um, but I think that um, ultimately she was just a really private person, very intelligent. Um, and she just wanted to live her own life as she saw fit. And uh, people just didn't seem to want to let her do that. But I find her story fascinating. So. I'm really glad you mentioned the, the spiritualism piece, which I know you all have an, a new kind of tour, trying to engage in um, you know helping folks understand the context of um, spiritualism in the 19th and early 20th centuries and the, the status of that practice. And it makes me think, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in about this house is, again, there's, there's this swirl of, of kind of legend around it, right? It's a compelling place. It's a place that people have wanted to tell stories about. And it's a place that do, people don't really think of as historical um, first of mind, as Isabella was noting, right? They think of other things, and yet it is a historical site, <coughs> a historical landmark on the state and national levels, and it's a site to engage audiences in historical learning, right? So I'm wondering if, um, if you all have thoughts about, you know, what are some of the stories uh, that this site and this um, figure of Sarah Winchester um, could tell well? What are some of the opportunities for remembrance, whether they're being fulfilled or not at this moment? What are some of the stories that this kind of illuminates at, as, a, as a site that's more than Disneyland potentially? Um, um, any thoughts about that, Isabel? Yeah, um, so um, I know that she died in like the 1900s. Um, 1927. Yes, so around that time, 1927, I believe, is the year that my tribe lost our title of federal recognition. So that is an interesting um, um, kind of connection around that time, like the 1920s. Um, but I think, like you said, like an opportunity maybe just to um, acknowledge the natives, the Aboriginal people of that land. Um, as like I said before, um, there's rich history and culture and memories that were made on that land and that still continue to be made on that land specifically by my people. Um, but just a brief, not even like a brief, but just um, acknowledging that history, acknowledging the, the plight as well as my people, I think that would be a good opportunity um, to intertwine the history of it with yeah. the Winchester history. Yeah, the history of the land is a kind of story available by this site. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, I have a little um, tale to tell. Um, <clears throat> after my book came out, I was frustrated with the documentation um, on the National Register about the Winchester House because the original documentation that was drawn up in the 1970s reiterated all those stories. You know, building went on 24-7. The, uh, it never mentioned the earthquake. Anyway, the documentation at the National Register is not correct. So I contacted the National Register and I said I would like to um, offer the research to update the documentation on that site. And they said, well, that um, goes through your State Office of Historic Preservation. Uh, we don't do it. So. Um, first thing I learned is the National Register is like a list. It's not, there's no there there, I guess. Uh, I thought there was. So anyway, I contacted the State Office of Historic Preservation, and they said, oh my gosh, nobody reads those forms anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, well, I do, and um, I have the research, and I would like it updated. And they said, we are, and I have all this in emails, we are not interested in a controversy about that property, excuse me. <clears throat> and so I said, so controversy, historical accuracy, and, and, and then they came back and said, <clears throat> there's only one party that can update the documentation and that's the owner of the property. 
And so if the owner of the property has no interest in doing that, it can't be done. So uh, they said, you can write a letter and it'll put it in the file. So that's in the file someplace in bureaucracy land. Um, but I think there's an opportunity now because all the research is done. It wouldn't cost anything. <laughs> they could, you know, correct the record um, and include um, the land in the in the record because that I, you know, I filled out forms for other properties. Um, excuse me, I'll get it, Maria. Um, so um, I just think. Correcting the um, records in the State Office of Historic Preservation and the National Register because they have these big plaques, um, you know, outside the house that have incorrect information on them. So the public is seeing this and presuming it to be true because it's on a plaque from the National Register. Mm -hmm. I wonder about all the plaques that you see around town. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that would be a wonderful thing to correct. I, there was a mistake made at that time, too, about the year she bought the house. Yeah, the, even the basic dates are wrong. Yeah, and er, in the early collateral of John Brown, it was correct. Um, the date was correct. And then at some point, they filled out the forms, and they changed it. Instead of 1886, um, they made it 1884, which is incorrect. She was not there for 38 uh, years. It was 36 years. So I would love to see all of that corrected. I can't see why. Anyone should be afraid to put the truth on it, and we'll see what we can. We'll see if we can do. Yeah, something. and it shouldn't. Co I, I, you wouldn't even need a lawyer. <laughs> no, it's not even about the. Money. I would just like to see that. I know they refused on the plaque. It says Winchester House. It does not say Winchester Mystery House because that's not. That's not a historical thing. So, and I appreciate the fact that it does not say mystery in there. Um, and we did actually think uh, some time ago about taking that word out of the title. Then the Winchester movie came along, and the tide swung back in the other direction, much to my dismay. Um, and there was no more talk about taking the mystery out of the house. Um, so I like to say it's where history meets mystery. But um, <laughs> April. You know, um, since we're talking about correcting things and writing women into history, it should really be the Sarah Winchester house, because she is the one who um, Absolutely right. Yeah, I, I, I'm really interested in this kind of thread of um, uh, the idea of, of, of the controversy that seems to be perceived in any kind of change to a historical record, right? The idea that that correcting dates even um, might might um, might be de facto a site of controversy according to the National Register. Um, and I'm wondering if there are other things from um, any of your perspectives, you know, as you're thinking about all of you in different ways share this mission, this interest in correcting the record, right? In, in kind of giving us a, a, a richer, fuller sense of what this site offers, what this land offers, what this woman's you know, story offers, however it is we want to frame it. There's, there's stuff there that's not coming out, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm wondering if you all have um, thoughts about the challenges to this. It is like administrative, like there is no there there. Contact, right? What are some of the other kinds of challenges that, that are kind of plaguing this effort to, to get these records changed? Um, not just at the Winchester House necessarily, it might be at other kind of historical sites. What are, what are some of the challenges on that from your perspectives? From our, in our position, our particular spot, um, a lot of the issue has always been, you know, historicity versus profitability. Yeah. Um, and obviously, it's a, it's a privately held property. And it is, um, it's a commercial venture. But um, at the same time, um, it's hard. You have to also remember, as much as you don't like to see something like that as a private entity, that if it had not been what it was, it would have gone under the wrecking ball. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. Um, it was in very bad shape when Sarah died, 
and it would have cost a fortune. In fact, it still has not been repaired to, to where it needs to be. It's an ongoing process. Um, Sarah herself never repaired it after the earthquake completely. She, she did little bits here and there, and then she stopped. Um, she had another beautiful house in Atherton, and she lived there much of the time after, um, I think, 1910. But um, a house like that, you look at historic homes around the Bay Area, and one of the biggest struggles they have is supporting themselves. And usually they're nonprofits, and they have to struggle to get the money to keep the walls up. I mean, an old house, the foundation starts to sink. Uh, the roof shifts a little bit and it starts to leak. And there's, there's so many problems that come with old homes like that. And the Winchester house is like that times 20 because there's so much of it. And we've had all of those problems and we, we still do, they're ongoing. Um, and it just was so costly. No one would have put their money into that, certainly, not, not to live there. Um, and so it was, it was the one thing that actually, that is the most annoying about the way it was kept, but also the one thing that kept it standing all these years. So it's, um, yeah, it's just like life. It's, it's complex, yeah. Can you repeat yeah. the question again? Yeah, yeah, just kind of thinking about um, what are some of the challenges to intervening in these kinds of um, historical stories like the Winchester History House? What are some of the, the ways in which that, um, that gets kind of stymied from your perspective? Um, well, my perspective would just be a lack of acknowledgement. Um, over the years, history has been corroded into like these forms of what is like pleasable for audiences to interpret mm -hmm. what they want to interpret. Um, for example, so like uh, mentioning historical sites, um, I live in San Lorenzo, and in my town there's this um, historical house called the McConaughey House. And growing up there, um, I would just be fascinated by it because it's a historical landmark. There's also the Meek Estate House, and these historical places they're on my people's ancestral homeland, and. Even people like in my tribe that live in the area, they've gone to these places, but they don't internalize that this is their people's land. Yeah. They don't understand that because it's not spaces for them to interpret that. Mm -hmm. they, don't have, they haven't had the opportunity to interpret that um, because it just hasn't been made available for us, even though there's like thousands of years of history seeped into this land that, and <coughs> history that is being made in the present. For example, like my people's fight for reaffirmation of federal recognition. So I just think Acknowledging, it's like a lack of acknowledgement is kind of what stops um, change from being made possible. Um, and this is very important because acknowledgement is really, um, it's a key factor towards, um, just towards moving forward, not only for my people, but other like natives as well, California natives especially, because our plight is very unique compared to the Americas, considering that California is like a place like that is very popular, um, and it's just sickening, kind of, to know that, like, because I know that in the present, like, many California natives are not able to live on their ancestral homeland. I know my people, so they've struggled to, like, f like to financially be able to live here, not only in California, but in the Bay Area specifically. Mm -hmm. So just acknowledging is very important step towards um, any like issue, basically, because if there's like no acknowledgement, how do people know? How do people know the issues? and the history that comes with these lands. Yeah. So I think then some acknowledgement is a key factor. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, opening up that space, inviting mm -hmm. that kind of realization mm -hmm. among all audiences. I think it's really interesting how you note that even uh, descendants uh, you know, of, of that, that land, land itself aren't being invited to see that, that connection, right? Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, Mary Jo, do you have any thoughts from, from your, you know, your perspective to kind of get your message out there via the book thing? Things that have been particularly challenging? Or maybe not. Um, uh, uh, my preference is to um, talk about uh, Sarah Winchester in biographical terms and um, not really say too much about the house. Um, just because that's not really my expertise, um, even though um, a lot of what is known publicly or presumed about Sarah Winchester has, has been generated 
um, by advertising campaigns um, and the House. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if, um, if some of that documentation got rectified, um, I'd be a happy camper. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's common to say, um, well, if we knew more, then it would be easier. But but your research kind of shows us we know quite a bit. Um, so it's not that the information isn't available. It's a kind of it's it's a different issue of kind of circulation and and uptake. To your point about kind of um, what audiences want to hear, um, and that goes back to Jan's point as well about you know that tension between being a place that um, you know historical house museums are not um, the kind of popular attraction often that the Winchester Mystery House is, right? They're not bringing international audiences. And it's interesting because when I've tried to take a lot of that, there's a lot less ghost, uh, kind of ghost stories in the tour than there were like decades ago. Um, and when I try to take that out, some people get indignant. They come and they see us and say, where are the ghost stories? We want to hear the ghost stories. That's why we came. We want to see this haunted house. Or they'll be angry because they didn't see a ghost on their tour. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you can't please all the people all the time. But um, it's the former ma uh, manager. I interviewed the former manager, or a former manager. I'm not sure if it's a, 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 Yeah. Yes. And yes. he told me that um, their marketing <laughs> surveys indicated the number one reason people visit the house is ghosts. Mm -hmm. And so. And so they're in the tourist industry, you know, and I, I'm saying that uh, like as a fact, not as a, a criticism. There's tourist spots and there's other kind of spots, you know. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice if the tourist spot could uh, not make fabrications about Absolutely. somebody. That should, yeah, that should um, never be done. But, but I mean, the reality is people go there for ghosts, mm -hmm. so. And yeah, and John Brown, it's important to remember too, John Brown, who um, leased the house in 1923, um, he couldn't quite afford it, no one else wanted it, but he built roller coasters for a living. He came from Philadelphia, he designed what's called the Backety Back Scenic Railway, and that's what he did. He worked at various um, attractions in Canada and in the United States, and so that was what he knew. He knew the attractions business, and that's how he intended to develop the estate. He wanted to make it into something more grand than it is now, and he wanted to make it into something that he was more accustomed to, with his railway and you know carousels. I've got boxes of his letters to his, you'll have to see these, um, to his wife and daughters when he would be away from them working. And um, so he, found the Winchester estate and he thought it would be perfect for something like this, that it, you know, a beautiful family entertainment center, basically, where people could come, an amusement park. He looked for funding but never could get any. He's, there are some wonderful letters he's written to people um, talking about how beautiful the land was and how you, know, you couldn't find anything more beautiful in California, that it was just perfect for what he wanted to do and that it was just an amazing place and he felt this was his chance. Uh, to do something wonderful, but he could not get the financing, so the house ended up being the attraction. There were all these built-in stories already floating around about Sarah, and he certainly didn't do anything to quash them. Um, it brought people in. That is what brought people in. The curious wanted to see this house where this supposedly very strange woman had lived and built this, this unusual place, and so they came. And then later on, when other people came to run the house after John Brown died, they were all from the amusement <coughs> industry, all of them. Some of them came from Frontier Village. If, I don't know if any of you are old, some of you are old enough to remember that, but it was a local um, theme park. It was really cute out on the kind of southeast part of town. And a lot of folks came from there to, to work at Winchester as well. Keith Kittle um, came from there. He was our general manager from about 1973 to um, just before he died in 1998. He really tried to get the place on the map, kind of like John Brown. It was very similar. They both spent the last 22 years of their lives promoting this place. And um, Keith was the one who put all those billboards up and down <laughs> 101. All the way. Some of you remember those with the skull. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was always run by tourism people. And so that's one reason why we never had a historian before either. It was not about history, really. 
it was, so now I'm trying to gather all of these papers and things from a hundred years that we've been open to the public. It's like in your house, you, you tuck things into drawers and closets, and this has been going on for a hundred years. So now I'm pulling all this stuff out and trying to get it organized into an archive so that we actually have something for people to visit online or in person and, and come and see some of the history. And you know, Mary Jo has laid it out very clearly, you know, what this woman's life was about. <laughs> Um, but we do have some wonderful information because there was, a, you know, the house has had separate lives. It had its life as Sarah's home and her ranch um, and a place where many people raised their families and worked and were very happy um, to the past hundred years where thousands of Santa Clara Valley residents have taken care of this home and tried to share a story, correctly or not, um, but kept the place alive. And um, so it's... It's a very interesting and complex sort of sort of history that it has. Yeah, I'd love to kind of link that back to um, some of some of Isabella's um, comments also to, to, to think, think a little bit more about like the ways that this, this news media site is trafficking in a kind of shared like settler imaginary. That frontier land is a really interesting link, right? right. The idea of, you know, again, that's that sense of, of audience, what the audience wants to hear, or the conception of who the audience is as a kind of you know, a, a predominantly white settler audience being imagined, right? And I'm thinking about the ways that Native history has kind of come in and out of view over the course of those documentation. Like the 70s was one of those peaks for um, the figure of the Native being part of that story more visibly. Um, but it wasn't the figure of the local native, right? <laughs> yes. It was the figure of uh, Plains Indian uh, natives most often. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if there's anything in that that anyone, um, does that spark thoughts for you about, again, how certain stories are being um, picked up or made available at this site through this, through this history, through this site. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think of there's a lot <laughs> yeah, um, well, the depiction of what a native is, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's people kind of don't know how to conceptualize what being indigenous, being native is, because there's so many, being native is very unique to each specific location, each person's tribal ancestral homeland. Um, California, Costa Noan natives, it's very different than Plains Indians. Um, it's different than people indigenous to Mexico. It's different than people indigenous to Canada. So it's, there's not one direct way to pinpoint what a native looks like, what a native acts like. Um, even just like right here for my people, we, we're Bay, Kosanoan um, natives. So, so it's very unique. Um, so yeah. that's been a struggle since colonization. I don't know. Like, yeah. That wasn't a struggle before because it was just even like intertribal marriages, um, like mm. for me personally, I'm like Ohlone also, but um, I'm Miwok too, and then my abuela is from Mexico, Sonora, mm. um, Mayo Indians, so there's a lot of indigenous roots in me, but um, I don't know, that wasn't a problem before with settler colonialism, mm -hmm. like, um, but yeah, I mean, personally growing up, I even struggled to interpret and like conceptualize what being a native is, what being a native looks like, I mean, media such as Pocahontas, I mean, Peter Pan, like, um, what was her name, Lily Joy, I believe? I forget the character from Peter Pan, but that's what I saw as being native, mm -hmm. having a tomahawk, having a teepee, having a feather. Mm -hmm. that, well, that's the media representation, that's what I kind of internalized, but, I mean, growing up, being a culturally active native, I mean, I go to powwows, <laughs> and I see all these different tribal nations interact with each other, um, powwow dancing, so, I mean, that's, a struggle just to depict what a native looks like, what a native acts like. There's no direct way to pinpoint it because based on like the location that you live on, there's always going to be a tribal community that has unique um, characteristics, unique, unique cultures about it. So it's just, and I know with like um, westward expansion and stuff like that, even with that, like coming to the California um, Manifest Destiny and stuff like that, people depicted Plains Indians, people depicted the stereotypical tomahawk, um, one feather on your head, mm -hmm. Indian, not the abalone wearing, dentillion wearing, pine nut mm -hmm. wearing um, Indians, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. But um, I know that's probably always going to be a problem because 
I mean, like history corrodes the, our present viewpoints, which is a problem, but that doesn't mean that we can like stop it and prevent it from persisting on through um, our lifetimes and our individual views. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I know that <laughs> in some, just the depiction of what a native is and how you interpret what being native is is a problem. It was a problem in the 1800s, I mean, um, problem in the 70s, problems in the current day, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, that complexity is really hard to represent, mm -hmm. that complexity of um, intersectional experience and identity for Native people as well as non-Native people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a built-in um, conflict uh, with Winchester and Native people, uh, and it's the gun. Yeah, right. And so uh, it's impossible to talk about Winchester in any iteration, Mrs. Winchester, uh, who earned her income from uh, arm, the most successful arms company in the last part of the 19th century. Um, the house named for it um, until recently had a gun uh, display. Um, so I'm just trying to put myself, if I am a visitor, and there's um, an acknowledgement or um, presence of indigenous people. Uh, I it would be hard for me with the with the gun because of the history of the gun and the people. And um, on uh, on uh, both sides, native people used Winchester rifles too, specifically at um, Little Bighorn, um, but. Um, I think um, the topic of um, firearms and the ambivalence in America um, and the disconnect, um, 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 people fighting over um, Second Amendment, uh, so it's part of a bigger, bigger conversation. And sometimes I um, think the twist to stories about Mrs. Winchester about the Winchester house are very much tangled up in the story of um, uh, firearms. And um, I, I found no historical evidence whatsoever that she felt guilty about earning money from guns or that she felt bad about guns. But if we're talking about us now, there's a whole different attitude than 120 years ago. I, we used to do um, tours, well, activities for school children. And before the pandemic, we would get grade school kids who were studying um, California history. And um, they would come in and we would design little activities for them so that they could kind of rotate. There'd be a large group. And some of them would go on a little tour of the house and some would learn about Victorian children's games. Of course, you know, there were no computers or iPods or television or radio. Um, and they would learn, um, why is this a Victorian house? What makes it a Victorian house? Um, and all sorts of different, there was a reading corner and things like that. And it occurs to me that it could be interesting to try to do something like that, but go back, mm -hmm. go back further yeah. to the first people who lived on that land and do instruction about that. I don't know if, it, do they cover that in some year of grade school now or yes. what um, year would that be? So fourth graders? It's still fourth, okay, yeah. Still fourth graders. I don't see why that couldn't be blended yeah. in and just made part of the story because it's important. It has to be. Yeah, yeah. I love the way you express, you know, building memories on the land is a bad. Oh, thank you. It's very nice. But just to say, you did a wonderful job consulting with uh, my very Emory Sayers. Uh, my good my Aki, so I looked at the water and the reeds differently. And it gave me a beautiful feeling about nature. And I go there are still a lot um, that get you know, the view of the land and the fruits and vegetables. And there's this wonderful cafe I haven't been to yet uh, at Berkeley. Makamham. I said that right? Yes, Makamham, you said it right. And St. Louis. Um, the only thing they spoke here. And yes, that has to be a part of the history. Building memories on the land, all the memories. And 
their boobs out. They really need to, to get to know some of their favorites. It'd be interesting to learn, yeah. Is there yeah. any commercial aspects that you brought that up for something and suggested that something like that could be incorporated historically? I think it's necessary and it would be beautiful and wonderful. Right. Because you're right. This is more of a pleasure. Yes, this is perspective I know. I was just thinking of the question. Do you have any questions for the people? Do you have any questions for the people? Do you have any questions for the people? What does one of us mean? I don't know what it means. Yes. Why don't you just think about it? Yeah. And I'm so glad we have you on the panel tonight. Absolutely. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. My family is not, um, I'm not um, of an indigenous, you know, ancestry but it makes me sick to see what we do to the land and and the way we treat this amazing place that we live mm -hmm. so i can't imagine how i would feel in your place yeah it's very frustrating because um while i'm blessed to be able to live here in the bay area but many of my tribal um community they're not able to live here they're not able to afford here some are even homeless they're not able to live on our ancestral land but it's very frustrating, but yeah, it's important to acknowledge. Yeah, I think it's very telling kind of where we begin telling these histories, right? Yeah. Where is the start of this story? You know, on the plaque, we've got, we've got dates and, and uh, the maybe earliest is about 1884, or maybe we go back to Dr. Caldwell who built the farmhouse um, that, that became the, but it's the, it's the house and it's the deeds and um, yeah. So I think it's an invitation to think about how we, how we conceptualize history, uh, who is part of that, when is part of that, and, um, and, and how we conceptualize ourselves as a part of history as well, right? That we are, we're, we're here still, we're making history um, ongoing. Um, are there, I think, do I, are we ending at 530? Over time, do I have time still for one more question and then Actually, I have till six. Good, that's what I thought. Good. Okay, that's what I was assuming, but then I was panicking. Um, I, I want to. I want to kind of explore that a little bit more in terms of you know, what are some of the other kinds of similarities to other local sites? Like we we like to think of the Winchester House as an anomaly, perhaps, but it's in a lot of ways not right. It's in a lot of ways you know facing similar kinds of problems of of remembrance and exclusion and, sure. mm -hmm. and um, you know, what else can we learn about historical remembrance and representation from the Winchester Mystery House as an example? Yeah, um, like I mentioned earlier, um, nearby where I live, literally like across the street, um, there's another historical house that I've visited numerous times, the McConaughey Estate. Um, and that's a problem that me and my mom have addressed too. We've told them that there's history there more than just the McConaughey's mm -hmm. going back thousands of years. Um, it's just an ongoing problem. Um, yes. Um, um, there's brutal history too, but there's also um, historical remembrance that should be put into these um, into the history that's being taught there instead of weaponized. Yeah. Because when you don't acknowledge stuff, it's weaponized. It's yeah. just silencing, trying to keep people dormant. So just um, just acknowledgement, like I mentioned before, is important. And some, like numerous historical houses still have stuff to learn. Um, yeah. Yes, especially in California. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And that they still can learn, yes. right? And they can revise and they can, yeah. and they can continue to develop those materials and perspectives. about um, kind of uh, takeaways for, you know, again, the, my angle on this is, is public memory, historical remembrance. Are there other things that we um, might notice that, that's going on here that are, are, are shared by other local sites, other local stories, other national stories? I have two little a anecdotes. One, uh, uh, yesterday a friend who happens to be a Jesuit said to me, I was talking about this panel, and he said, well, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Oh. <laughs> um, and uh, the, um, the grandson of 
the farm uh, foreman said to me, Mary Jo, the truth doesn't sell. And so the public has some more responsibility to um, um, demand a, a quality product, uh, to think, um, and, and how uh, we get to that point, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I think there's really something to be said that um, storytelling and fictionalizing, um, maybe it takes us out of some of the troubled world we occupy for a little brief period of time and, and that has some purpose. Um, but um, it, it's not just um, the source, it's, it's, the, it's the people who believe it too, so. Absolutely, yeah, it's like I was talking about with April, Go ahead, April. I was going to say what, what we're after is not really historical. In fact, we're after entertainment. And until history steps up and makes it, how can I say, historical attention that tells a better story, we're going to have that dilemma. And I think that that's happening in this world. It's just, you know, like you said, the public is a part of it learn how to engage people. They have to feel themselves in the story somewhere, mm -hmm. I think, to, to actually become engaged. And some people really get bored when I start talking about the, I, I, I like to do interviews about the design of the house, about the decoration of the house, the aesthetic period, and, and a lot of people just kind of go, <laughs> disappear. Um, but there's so much that you could talk about that house, even in the more recent past, if you wanted to talk about, not ghosts, but you could talk about the stained glass windows. There's an amazing collection of stained glass windows in that house that is just astonishing. Um, and there's a huge story there. There's the aesthetic period, art for art's sake, the whole you know interior of the house. Why did she build it the way she did? Why doesn't it look completely different? It, there are many reasons you know that contributed to that. The famous wallpaper in the house, the Lincrusta Walton wall covering. Um, also the American art tiles. There's a huge story for the American art tiles. We have beautiful tiles. That's a whole industry unto itself. But there are many stories that could be told. And I would love to try to get some of those. You know, you try to suggest, well, let's have a tour about the architecture or about the windows. And they're like, well, but do you think really there'll be many people interested in that? Well, I think there don't have to be as many as there are who are interested in the ghosts. But maybe you could have Tour, specialty tours like that periodically that people might be interested in coming to see. Um, I guess we don't know until we try, but I would love to try that. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this um, together and I'd love to see where we can go with it. So, because I know there's, there's many other avenues that we could take and uh, love to see what we can do. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, open it up to some other questions as well. I've, I've I've monopolized the conversation. Uh, it, it, uh, in terms of revising the record with the, all the new facts we have, my question is for all three of you. Have any of you tried to update Wikipedia on your areas of expertise? And what have you experienced if you did that? It's not pretty. Um, <laughs> We did try to correct some of this. Somebody went in there and started, <coughs> and it wasn't even. Yeah. I know who. Uh, is this one you know? <laughs> uh, I hate to interrupt, but Go ahead. There's, there's a watchdog, actually, um, in Canada. That's at, the one. <laughs> and she, uh, um, I don't know about the house, but the, the site for Sarah, the Wikipedia site for Sarah Winchester used my book extensively. Yes, and, and, and not very well written. <laughs> no, I mean, your book is well written. <laughs> the way she used it was not very well done. Anyway, she did contact me and say what she was doing. She belongs to a group of people who um, kind of, I was going to say, use the word dog, Wikipedia. So they try to go into sites that, are, that are, have false information and try to correct it. And I guess they're all over the world. Yeah. Um, so I haven't checked it recently. Is it awful? Uh, well, uh, she, it, yeah. she, um, the Sarah Winchester site, I think, has improved over what it yeah, was. And that I could check. The problem is that they're doing our site. And our site is not 
Sarah Winchester, as you know. It's a commercial your, business. Your site or your Wikipedia? Oh, Wikipedia page, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. okay. And so they put things was, public. Yeah, and we're not apparently allowed to correct things or change things in there. Um, I think anybody I, our, our marketing, a gal who does the marketing was trying to, and these people were coming at her like, like I don't know, guard dogs. Um, and she finally had to give up because they, they would block her out because she would try to correct things. And I mean, there were things in there that I knew were wrong. And I, there were factual things about the house that were just wrong. And we would try to change it and they'd change it back. And we'd try to change it and they'd change it back. And finally we just gave up because we were getting blocked out. And I don't think that is admirable either. I, I can't see that that's a good way to go. I, I don't like that. Yeah. Um, with the Wikipedia, um, that's also been a messy situation for us because in the citations, if you check, they don't even use our tribe's official website that has intensive amounts of history with our local ethno historian, which is very um, just troubling to know because it doesn't even, it's not even intensive, it's just very vague. It's Costanoans and then maybe a little bit about Ohlone, but not specifically Mark Maloney, not even like barely any Miwok or just, it's just very vague. And when you do try to edit it, some people come back and they can edit it themselves. So it's just weaponized against us, which is very unfortunate. Um, but we and try to like prevail over that um, just by adding information to our muakfa.org site, which you can visit to learn more about my people and our tribe. But um, Wikipedia has it hasn't been a good situation. It's been very messy and very problematic. But yeah. I don't think much of I used to use it all the time. Now, I don't think much of it. Uh, <laughs> seeing what I've seen that they've put on ours that, it, that I know is incorrect. And, yeah. and they get so kind of vicious when you try to, they get personal too. It's not, it's not nice. <laughs> it's troubling because that's what people go to. They think Wikipedia is a very reliable source. Exactly. Don't they realize, exactly. I mean, if you just like do a little more intensive research, you can find out about this stuff. But people right. don't want to do that because they're very dull. Minded, I yeah. guess. Yeah, say. it's too hard. It's too it's much too work. It's too hard. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They're not like they're not like Mary Jo. They don't want to do the work. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I like the idea of including, definitely, you know, as a representative of my tribe, including that part of it because um, our tribe works a lot with schools, and we've done many uh, presentations when we can. Um, and I think the children would be interested if you can incorporate more about the first people to activities. I was even having this thought because we're in that mode of gardens, and I thought, you know, if I focus a lot of the home, what about the perimeter of the home? Maybe have, you know, a garden there, and maybe some of the, the, the grasses or the plants or that grew there. Um, I think that's something that the children would really appreciate. Because not everybody, you know, I personally do appreciate a good ghost story. But, <laughs> but you know, being here as a representative of the tribe, I think, yes, more of our community people included in that story of, of Sarah Winchester. But I think also not all families go there for the story. They maybe they do want to know more about the history. So kind of incorporating that. So we are willing to work with you all if you do outreach and we can collaborate and be able to offer maybe some videos for the children or some more historic information, some plants possibly that we might be coming out. So that would be wonderful. That would be great. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would be an annoying academic and have a comment and a question. Um, <laughs> so the comment, so I was a guide there in 96 and 97. Um, for a total of 13 months. I know you. Maybe. It's been a long time. <laughs> I, God, I do know you. <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that, as a guide, just to add to the, the memory um, conversation that's going on, is as a guide, we're doing a script. Um, but we have our script rules about going off script and not going off script. Um, um, and um, I, that's one of the things. I don't remember the exact things. It's been so long. But... Um, um, I found that kind of an interesting part of the discussion is like that the owners had very specific things. We weren't allowed to tell our own ghost stories for one thing, despite the fact that, you know, everybody liked the ghost stories and couldn't tell our own. Do we have that one tonight? We actually let them tell their own ghost stories now. Too? <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. I have a productive one. 
<laughs> the problem, and I agree, if you ever go to, say, Hearst Castle, they interpret the tour in their own way. Each yeah. person tells it differently. Yeah. And I kind of like that approach. The problem is that we've found over time that if you let people go off script, a lot of times they start, like, they'll do their own research, and they'll start right. telling right, stories right, 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 even yeah. worse than the ones that John Brown told, and just like, okay, this is bad. Stop. Stop. So we, what we try to do, we try to make it so that if they find something they want to talk about, they can come to us and say, okay, can I tell this in the, in the tour? Is this okay? And then we kind of vet it and say, well, that's garbage, or <laughs> okay, but, you know, as long as your tour doesn't run too long. Right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, um, it's always been an interesting challenge. So I don't believe, I think it's more of, um, you take the script that we give you and you interpret it by, you, you can give it in your own words, right? right, right. Um, you don't have to follow every single word. And um, you can add things if you found them and they're accurate and you find them interesting because the more, um, the more you are involved with, you know, whatever it is you're telling, the more engaging you're going to be. So, um, yeah, that's, that's always been kind of an interesting problem. Yeah, yeah, I just sort of remember that was like kind of a, like a thing, like, you know, just, just don't go off script. I've heard the darndest things on tour sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> My question is actually related to what I couldn't like go off script about when you'd have those questions at the end of the tour about, well, what do you think? What do you think, right? And I'd always kind of like deflect. But one of the things I was always fascinated with is like how this house sort of operates as like a site of grief or memorial. Um, uh, grief in all types of ways. Um, and they kind of played it more carnivalesque. Like it's like, oh, the seances and that like communicating with the dead, spooky, spooky. But not really about like serious grief because they kind of wanted to make her more hysterical, right? Um, uh, so I was just curious to ask the panel kind of what your thoughts are on the house and, or on Sarah as being kind of like a grieving or not just being a site of grief. Um, is that something like 26 years I've been thinking about? <laughs> Uh, um, she, uh, Sarah Winchester definitely uh, embarked on building that house to assuage her grief. I mean, that's the whole reason she came to California, partly her own health. Um, and we know that sh um, her sisters came to California at the same time. They all came together. Um, her initial plan was that they would all live together, so most of them anyway. Um, and that very quickly did not work out. Um, uh, uh, but um, her doctor told her engage in some hobby, whatever her hobby was, interior design and architecture and landscape architecture. And so for about 20 years, and um, evidence that I have is that basically at the 196 earthquake, just about everything on that property ceased except for some repairs. Um, although the gardening kept up, but not by her, by others. So um, I think there's definitely room um, uh, to capitalize on grief. Uh, I, um, well, that's a bad way to put it, Mary Jo, <laughs> capitalize on grief. I, could, I would say that she suffered grief at that time, but I don't think that people would go to a venue for entertainment if it's steeped in real grief. They might go to a memorial garden or something like that, you know. You actually have an interesting point in your book um, about the ways that the nature <laughs> Built about guns onto the figure of Sarah Winchester as well. So there's that additional kind of, um, as you said, there's not evidence that she herself felt guilt about um, or, or grief um, in relation to the, the guns um, and the violence um, that, they, that they perpetuated. But um, I think unless I'm misremembering, I think you make this point. No, uh, yeah, it's in the true. early 20th century, as attitudes about guns were kind of shifting and about westward expansion and about the violence that that represented, that there was a way in which the nation was able to offload um, and scapegoat, as it were, um, so that, yeah. 
And I also um, added to that um, sort of a discomfort, or not a discomfort, but ambiguity about an afterlife, an afterlife or not an afterlife. And so that's how some of the, the ghost and the guns gets kind of all um, tangled up. Hi everyone, thank you all so much uh, for this panel. Uh, my name is Britta Bookser. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Child Studies. So I've been especially excited to be thinking tonight about storytelling and engaging children in this site. Um, and not only just a site, a place that has a land history, but really humanizing and capacitating that history as a history of people. In our class, students who are here tonight work on projects that are culturally relevant and affirming children's stories. And I'm curious how you think about this place as you've described being alive, right? And this idea that to be able to engage with the story, visitors need to be able to see themselves in it. I would love if you could describe more, and Isabella, I'd be especially curious about your thoughts about how children might see themselves represented in this place, and what is necessary for a culturally relevant and affirming storytelling for visitors to Winchester. Um, well, when you asked that question about children, instantly I thought about the children in our tribe. Um, personally, I have a younger sister. She's just turned 11 yesterday. but. Um, um, I know, well, growing up, my mom would read me, like, children's stories um, in our Chochenyo Ohlone language. Um, so I know that storytelling is very important because it kind of shapes who you are, shapes how you interpret things and how um, just, like, when you're surrounded by that, it can be either uplifting or, like, hold you down. But um, I think that's, there's, it's a broad way to, like, kind of, like, um, tell the stories. I know uh, it could be maybe a story about the land, the history, um, but that's just my perspective, maybe about the plants. Um, but yeah, it's, with storytelling, it's a lot of different ways you can go um, to tell it, but that's how I interpret it. Yeah, there's a way in which the site wants to tell a story of disconnection and othering rather than a site of connection. Um, and figures of this story. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting way to think about it. Um, we are at time. So if you have a question for one of our panelists, we do have um, a reception set up outside. Uh, so if they are able to, to um, visit for a bit, um, I'm sure we can continue this conversation with some refreshments. We do also have one more drawing for one additional copy of Mary Jo's book and some more tickets that we want to get out there as well. Um, should, we, should we thank our panelists? <laughs> Now these are really in, de in demand, aren't they? Really looking forward to the tickets and the books. Okay, more giveaways on their way. Lisa Robinson. Yes, <laughs> Olivia Rennie. Rakesh Mehta. <laughs> Got two, so I'm going to call these out at the same time. Britta Book, sir. <laughs> yeah. And Alyssa Lee. <laughs> And 
deficient, so I'm repeating it. Uh, Monique Covarrubias. Lisa Francesca. And Veronica Miranda. So Veronica had to leave, but I work in the office just down the hall from her. <laughs> oh, uh-huh. I yeah. promise they will get to we trust you. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the uh, last copy of the book goes to Leanna Goodwater. I wanted at the last time you spoke here, so I'm going to pass on that because I've already got a sign. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Maria Hudgens. <laughs> Maria Hudgens. Those of okay, you once again, a huge thank you to our panelists and to uh, <laughs> Professor Amy Liu. <laughs> Refreshments are outside, and yes, please feel free to come forward and, and talk to the speakers. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning.